Hello, my name is Sherian and I'm an anchor at Bloomberg Television. I'm joined now by Nubar Afayan, founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering and co-founder and chairman of Moderna. Nubar, it's good to see you again. Good to be here. So the pandemic has really shown the critical nature of health security, right? Not only to individuals, but to entire societies and economies. How much confidence does the vaccine response give you that the world is ready for another pandemic? Well, I think that we're just beginning to get ready for the existing pandemic. Um, I'm not sure that we can express a lot of confidence for the last uh, for, for a new pandemic. Uh, and that'll all depend on what we do going forward. And it's really too early to tell whether we've even understood the lessons of the current one, let alone have the political will to, to continue to, to do the right set of things, such as collaborations and, and forethought and planning and communication. I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be done. So I'd say my confidence in, in dealing with the current pandemic is increasing. My confidence about the next pandemic is awaiting important decisions and commitments. The world did go down an unconventional path when it comes to vaccine development, right? Whether it's breakneck speed or just uh, facing the risks of deploying untested technologies as well. How do you expect this to impact the traditional pharma R&D? Well, let me let me provide a little bit of context for this because you know when we say quote untested technologies, I think that in the in the rush of the last year, a, a lot of things were uh, kind of discovered for the first time, and they were thought to be something that was happening out of the blue. Um, in the case of Moderna, which is a company that uh, we had the the great privilege of of being uh, founders of um, ten years ago, we've spent the last 10 years developing a platform, uh, a set of hundreds of patents and, and IP, uh, manufacturing capabilities. Uh, and before this uh, nasty virus, SARS-CoV-2, ever showed itself to the, the conscience of humans, we had nine vaccines that had been tested in humans, all showing neutralizing antibodies, and another half a dozen therapeutics, protein therapeutics, whether it's in vaccines or, or cardiovascular disease. So, so it, it is, in fact, uh, a, a new application of a relatively new technology, but I wouldn't say it hadn't been tested. Now, it had not been tested in hundreds of millions or billions of people, and, of course, there's very few uh, pharmaceutical or vaccine technologies that have. And so when it came to going after this, the main reason why mRNA was deployed was that in the prior years leading up to that, all the data pointed to the fact that this was a completely different in terms of speed, predictability, robustness, scalability, a different platform than we had previously. And so we were glad to be able to put it to use uh, to, to, to really combat this virus. So when it comes to putting it in actual use, how important were partnerships either with the public or the private sector in actually making this come together? Uh, extremely useful. Vital wouldn't have happened without partnerships. And I don't just say that in the loose sense of partnerships. Partnerships are always good, but, but in this case, they were essential. And, and let me tell you just how many different partnerships and of different kinds had to be there. Um, first of all, uh, the NIH. We had a prior partnership with the NIH, working on MERS, working on other mRNA vaccine technology with the NIAID, the very specific group that, that uh, Dr. Fauci uh, uh, is in charge of. And they had familiarity uh, in their own hands of what mRNA could do. And that's why they were excited to, to be the first to, to enter into human trials with our technology for the COVID-19. Again, we'd done it before with other vaccines. Uh, then partnerships that allowed us to scale up manufacturing, most notably with Lonza, uh, one of the largest global contract manufacturers of pharmaceuticals. Uh, but for their partnership experience, rapid ability to deploy uh, capabilities, uh, even though we had to transfer technology and work with them, that would have been impossible to scale, even to the up to billion doses that we're uh, aiming for in 2021. That would have been a fraction of that number 
uh, had we not done that. The U.S. government um, in many forms, BARDA, DARPA, prior to that, uh, we had worked with already. That meant there were trusting relationships that were put to the test in moving really literally overnight. New partnerships were formed with CEPI, most recently with the whole COVAX initiative. And of course, OWS, Operation Warp Speed, that was literally uh, put into existence in order to eliminate the barriers to collaboration and partnership, provided a very strong signal that the US government wanted vaccines to be developed of mm. many types with backup plans. And again, I, I cannot, as, as a private citizen, having nothing to do with politics, I cannot fathom what happened last year, had right. all of that, each and every one of those things, not been in place, and many more I didn't mention. Given everything that you're talking about right now, did it surprise you that we continue to see these uh, tensions and competition between nations when it comes to acquiring supplies of the shots? Well, given the relative disorganized state that the world found itself in when this virus uh, uh, decided to attack uh, one of the big vulnerabilities of human beings, which is their social nature, uh, if you think about this, this is a an evolutionary battle between a virus that literally preys on our social nature in transmitting itself and humans who increasingly want to interact, be mobile, and be more and more in social uh, 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 places, which, in, which means that the virus can transmit and evolve. So that battle royale, if I can call it that, very much uh, caught humanity off guard. We do very little in a, in a collaborative way. Just look at climate change. Uh, and there are many other things, refugee crisis, where it divides us. It does not bring us together. But it took a virus to actually bring people together in a somewhat slow, clumsy way, I would say. But certainly a year into it, there's a lot more uh, uh, pan-country collaboration, which we very much appreciate. But when we started, countries, continents thought this was their problem to solve on their own. Uh, we interacted with many of them, and we could see the very different mindsets. Some wanted proof that a vaccine could work, let alone a, what they thought was an untested vaccine, and they waited for that proof. And by the time the proof came, they just realized they were quite late in the, so, in the, in the lineup. So now 18 months into the pandemic, are you seeing countries become more collaborative with each other, more cooperation on the ground, perhaps, in getting these vaccine supplies? I think we're beginning to see signs of that, certainly with the U.S. opening up to uh, enabling others. You know, clearly, the U.S. has spent more, done more in finding solutions, and now it has to share with the world. And, I th and I'm very pleased to see the U.S. government take steps in that direction, most notably recently at the G7, and it's continuing. Uh, certainly, Europe is beginning to take some concrete steps. Uh, and and I'll, you know, we'd love to see more of that. We hear the calls from African countries. We hear the calls from South America. But the reality is that the supply chains that have been established to make the billions of doses already that are being ramped up to be made for this year and then, of course, next year, that's going to have to be further expanded, and that's going to take coordination. So I think that increasingly the will is there, the, the, the narrative is there, now we have to come through on it. What about increasing the supply itself? I know that Moderna has said that they, you won't be enforcing patents for the mRNA technology during the pandemic period, but the intellectual property waiver conversations continue at the WTO. If this is actually passed, will this set a precedent that perhaps is not good long term for the industry? Well, we recognized early on that at least as related to mRNA, the vast technology platform that we had invested in several billion dollars before this pandemic started could potentially play a role not only with us, but, but in terms of others being able to use the technology. And we decided that last October, as you mentioned, we announced that during the pandemic, we would not be enforcing our intellectual property on others who are using it to combat the, the pandemic. Um, we, we believe that that makes some of the alternative approaches less necessary, less important. And importantly, I think anything we do now has to take into account the future, future pandemics, future generally drug development and what whatever can be done not to discourage innovation, I think is an important role for governments to play. And, and, and others have said, and I'll repeat here, that the major challenge to supply is not distributed production. It's actually supply chains to have enough of the input raw materials 
to make things at large scale. And the best people who can scale it up are the people who already have. Moderna has said that it will reach upwards of 3 billion doses next year. I think Pfizer has said even a slightly higher number. Between those two numbers, uh, plus several of the other manufacturers, I think you're looking at well north of 10, 15 billion doses. So starting from scratch today, setting up a facility to produce mRNA or any other vaccine is going to at most matter to the next pandemic. We, I don't see how it matters right. to the current one based on where we are already. Talking about equitable vaccine access to the world, we do have a couple of polls for our audience. Now, the first question would be, how should the global vaccination rollout be prioritized? You can actually answer those uh, questions on your browser. The second poll asks, are vaccine passports a good idea? Once you answer those questions, you can actually see the results right away. So Anubar, continuing our conversation on equitable access, what else can Moderna do? What other solutions are there other than, say, IP waivers and supply chains uh, helping build a more resilient supply chain in these uh, vaccine shot distributions? I think that uh, I think that what's going to become important is to continue to work with the entities that are taking on the kind of pan nation uh, uh, supply. Uh, that is the coordination role, uh, also the consistency of of demand. In other words, you know, it's very difficult for a supplier to ramp up and spend its own capital if the outlook is uncertain. Of course, people who want to access vaccines want infinite flexibility not to take it, to, to take it much later. And all of those things, unfortunately, uh, run counter to robust supply and production. And so I think there has to be a clear, coordinated effort to make sure that we know what kind of volumes can be produced, how that's going to go from the manufacturing uh, floor all the way to the arm of individuals. And there's a lot of work mm. to be done in many, many places. We continue to make advances in storage. So, for example, we've said it used to be that we could, we've could, we said we could store our vaccine at room, temp at room temperature. Now we've increased that in refrigerated. We said a month. Now it's much more than that. So the technology keeps improving, but the logistics, the coordination, there's more and more work to be done there, I think, until we're quite sure that we vaccinated right. a large subset of the population. Newmar, we continue talking about managing this outbreak, managing the pandemic. Let's talk a little bit about preventing the disease altogether, right? What lessons are we taking from here so we don't face another crisis, another health crisis of this magnitude? Well, there's, there's a couple of things that, I, that, that I'd like to point out. First of all, I think there is a fundamental relationship we have uh, with our health that it would be useful to reconsider. I, I, I hear on Bloomberg and other programs these days, how much people are reconsidering their lives, their livelihoods, their jobs, their relationships post-pandemic. Well, I'd like to throw in there our relationship with health, something we could reconsider. And why do I say that? If you look at our current healthcare system, it's largely focused on not healthcare, but disease care, sick care. And by far the vast, vast majority of our money, 95, 97% is spent on things that happen after we're sick. So upstream from that, there's very little money, attention, government support that goes in. And indeed, all of vaccines, all of early detection of threats goes into that. So first, I think we need to, as societies, say, you know what? We need to deal with these things before they happen, pre-disease states. And by the way, this doesn't only apply to pandemics. This applies to infectious diseases. This applies to any disease. Turns out that long before cancer manifests, there are biological states that take place that can be intervened with. Same with cardiovascular disease, same with diabetes. So I think one important takeaway is, should we think of our health as a matter of security instead of care? Just like we mm. think of our physical security and we ask our governments through the defense efforts, through counteracting terrorism, through any number of means to protect us from these threats. I think if we start thinking from a security standpoint and thinking of medicine as something you do preemptively, not reactively, I think these are fundamental shifts in where we should put dollars, where euros, where we should put the best minds to work. And that's going to take a lot of uh, uh, work because our current regulatory systems, our current reimbursement systems simply 
encourage waiting for the disease to fully take hold, only to then come along with very, very powerful potential treatments or cures. Right. Uh, no wonder it costs so much. No wonder it takes that long. We're waiting too long. So flagship pioneering just raised $3.4 billion for a new fund. How are you bringing this vision that you talk about uh, in actually putting money where your mouth is? Well, uh, a significant portion of our new cycle of innovations, flagship is, is all about making breakthrough innovations and creating the next generation of bio platform companies out of them. And that's what Moderna is. 10 years ago, it was the beneficiary of the, of the expertise and capital and people we deployed into that project. And 10 years later, we're doing that uh, uh, quite at an even larger scale. This new uh, capital pool will add to the remainder that we've had in the past and will accelerate even further doing the, these very things. But in particular, looking at preemptive medicine and health security as a major important uh, area. For example, can we develop completely new early detection technologies for cancer? Could we detect long before cancer manifests early signs that can be acted on? Neurodegenerative disease, same category. Could we have interventions that years before one gets to a point where they have rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, autoimmune diseases, could we have taken steps that delay or deter the ultimate disease? And of course, in infectious disease, can we create surveillance? Can we create much more rapid action when we see these threats Coming. We, we're using, for example, AI machine learning these days to forward project all the different variants, not only from SARS-CoV-2, but from influenza and for many other mm. viruses, because we have the data now to be able to track ahead of its time what the virus may do and anticipate it and combat it. All of that is ahead for us, and it's an exciting time, although it took a pandemic and lots of loss to bring this to the forefront. So is this sort of thinking going to help when it comes to slow pandemics and not just fast pandemics like we've had this time around where you've had all of this effort globally come together? Well, it's a great question because one of the interesting observations, you know, you roll back the clock a year and, and, and everyone was speculating that vaccines that take less than three, four years to develop are by definition unsafe and cannot be made and cannot be trusted. And, you know, we did we and Pfizer and others did trials that were as big, if not bigger than what one typically sees, showed robust data on safety and efficacy and rolled it out. And in the field, basically the vaccine has been doing the same or better than what the tests had showed and now across hundreds of millions of people. And so there's a lot of learning there, but the question is after the pandemic, let's say wanes somewhat, are we gonna go back to saying, okay, now it now has to take five years again to develop a vaccine or are we gonna, as a regulatory process, come up with ways to take the learnings and work with industry, work with others in the medical community to do the same robust type of work, but in a collaborative way, perhaps faster. We, you know, we watch slow pandemics, cancer, Alzheimer's, obesity, take lives, take lives by the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands per year. But somehow there's nothing urgent about that because that's considered mm. business as usual. I think some level of intolerance to the status quo that diseases are meant to take lives and hurt people and therefore that's okay but a virus that's 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 different in my view it's not different it's not different if you lost a family member as i've lost two parents to cancer to me frankly that's that's a very important threat that i live with and that and that my family and everybody i know lives with why not apply the same type of intensity and collaboration and motivation to that disease, I think we could right. do a lot better. 20 seconds, Newbar. Are there any global institutions that could lead the way? I think that this is going to be a collaborative effort between research institutions, the private sector, governments, very importantly, because they, they're all over the policy and regulation side to this. And then we have to see whether health security should be the subject of some pan- a, a, a national pan-government effort. I don't think we need yet more institutions, right. but we need to make sure the institutions have the right signal and the right mandate to work on the right set of problems. Nubar Afayan, co-founder and chairman of Moderna and CEO and founder of a global, a Pioneer, flagship pioneering. Thank you very much for your time today. It was good seeing you again. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks for having me.